Institute. Very happy to have all of you uh, joining again this afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. I hope you're all well. Evening for me. Healthy. Evening for you. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's some West Coasters in here somewhere who are, who are logging on. Um, so we're, uh, I'm excited to have Enrico and Moritz here to talk about whatever we're going to talk about. So ground rules are as casual as always. Um, we don't really have an agenda. So throw your questions in the chat box and I'll set up a queue or raise your hand if you can figure out how to use the little Zoom hand raise thing and we'll set up a little queue and you can ask your questions directly. Um, I'm happy to read your question if you, if you don't want to unmute yourself or, or for whatever reason. Um, it's all good to go. Um, so I thought we would do the standard uh, thing of let you guys introduce yourselves. If you want to just play the tape from like a recent podcast episode, you could do that too. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, a good routine by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you figure it out, but we read it every every time we reread it. We never you know, read it. <laughs> I noticed that and I and, and like the third time I, I actually went back and I listened to one like a few weeks earlier and I was like, it's different. Why are they re-recording this every time? Yeah. So, so the story is, we started the first 80 episodes all start with Enrico asking me how the weather was like. And we were like, okay, oh, is that right? That's something that cannot continue. <laughs> and then, then the other thing we realized is, well, not everybody has been listening to all 80 episodes. Some people don't even know what the podcast is about. You know, we have new listeners sometimes. So these two brilliant insights led to us having a fixed intro. And we, we never looked back. It's good. <laughs> now, do you still, are you still what the weather is like on a podcast? The, it's just stupid. I mean, it's, there's yeah. no debate about yeah. that. I hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do you still clap when you start it? No. Yeah. No. It's, 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 done it's with more clapping. sophisticated now. We yeah. clap afterwards. High five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe, I mean, we've already started, so... Right, right. That's right. Um, I'm going to guess there are going to be some questions for you guys about um, how to run the podcast and all that stuff. And those are all um, great to have. And I'm, there's going to be lots of questions. So why don't we, just, why don't Enrico, why don't you just start, tell people who you are and then, um, yeah. And then Moritz, you can go and then we'll just, we'll just take it from there. Sure. Sure. So I'm um, Enrico Bertini and um, I am um, an associate professor at New York University. Uh, in New York City, and I've been here for a while. And uh, my job is mostly to do research and teaching data visualization and visual analytics. And then together with Moritz, I have this, this crazy podcast that we've been <laughs> recording for X number of years. Seven, <laughs> what is that? Six, seven, seven years? Eight? Seven? I don't know. It's all a blur. Eight, yeah. eight, it's all a blur. It's a blur by now. Yeah. And but it was yeah, the, it was the first real like data visualization podcast, right? Um, I think so. I think I yeah. Know. When we started off, we were not aware of any other data viz yeah. podcast specifically. No. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and now there's so many. That's cool. And now there's so many. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You, yeah. You're like you're like the grandfather. The grandfather's at the top of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, after so many years, we're still questioning whether it makes sense at all. But but apparently, yeah. people listen to it. Yeah, yeah. we I, I we we've had that discussion with a particular guest that we both try to get. Who says <laughs> yeah. you can How can you talk about how can you talk about visualization in an audio only format? Well. You write about it with words, so you know. We we toyed a bit with video, but video is super hard to produce well, yeah. and and also the pace is totally different, and you can't have these casual long conversations on video, really. Right. Um, but i like Iga Eyes has like uh, Robert Kozara does great video. There's also a few other like YouTube formats yeah. now. I think that's amazing, but. We, we tried it, but we were like, ah, it's not for us. Let's go back to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, it's, it's one thing if you're just a person in your office doing a YouTube thing, trying to teach people something. It's yeah. different when, you know, one guy's in but New I'm York and someone saying, else is in Berlin yeah. and someone else is in the UK. I mean, that's a whole yeah. different thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I already got one question in here uh, just directly to me and also I'll just feed it to you guys. And that's, uh, I think it's a really nice place to start. And I don't, we don't need to spend the whole hour talking about COVID, but it is a good question because it actually is a debate that's ongoing, obviously. 
Um, and the question is, should all COVID visualizations be designed in conjunction with a subject matter expert? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like everything else about COVID, there's no certainty about anything. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. I think I think it depends what you're trying to do. Uh, I've been thinking about this myself for a while because there are contra I, I think we have seen quite a few articles during the last few days that basically argue you shouldn't do anything unless you have an epidemiologist next to you. Um, yeah, maybe. On the other hand, I think it depends how you do it. If you if you don't know anything about epidemiology and then you do some database and you publish it and you sell it as if that's mm. the best analysis in the world and you pretend to give advice to to the White House, um, yeah, right. Yeah. right? It's not the right approach. On the other hand, I'm kind of like concerned that carbing people's, I mean, I'm using the word enthusiasm here, it's not really appropriate, but I think it's fine if people if if people explore things and try things mm -hmm. out. I think the problem is not the, is not trying things out and trying to make sense of something. Mm -hmm. I think for me the problem is more like the way you actually present it to the world. If you decide to present it to the world, so I I do buy the argument. On the other hand, I'm kind of like concerned that this is like discouraging people to to explore and experiment. Yeah. Yeah, mm. that's a great point. I I think the framing really matters. But I think that the problem is the default reaction people have when they see a cleanly designed chart is that it's ground truth and like proven. Right. And so you actually have to, if you're not an expert in a field or if you don't trust your data, you have to signal that very clearly, I think. And so if you, by default, people might misread it as, oh, here's an expert's opinion. And right. you're just an expert in charting software, but you're not a domain <laughs> matter expert, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I think you have, but if you come from a personal thing, like, hey, I'm trying to make sense out of something, or I wanted to see how my hometown looks like, you know, and really present it as like a very a personal view, I think it's, it's great. Yeah, why not? I, I wonder, um, I wonder what your take is on projects like Makeover Monday and Tidy Tuesday, and I think there's a Thursday one too. Um, yeah, I can't keep track. Well, there's Thursday, all these various Thursday. projects where, they, <laughs> yeah. where they're like, here's some data, go make a bunch of stuff. And um, in some ways, if, if, if someone's going to argue that um, you should only you know, make stuff that you're an expert in or have an expert next to you, then it would seem like a Makeover Monday type project would, would be subject to the same criticism. Um, but for me, I feel like those projects are, they're about the, the, the viz part. And so they're separate from the, from, the, from the expertise that might be needed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you can just train your viz muscles on, on any data set or right. on any like, you know, given chart and see like, oh, could I make this more effective with what I understand it, it wants to say and so on. Um, at the same time, it is interesting that often the most successful visual representations don't come from database experts, but from domain experts. Like we've seen yeah. this in climate science, you know, we've seen it now in with the the uh, like the the uh, COVID challenge and so on. So, and, and that comes, I think, from if you are really into a topic, you will know better what people are really really interested in, and uh, and this is what matters in the end, like what's relevant yeah. and and what's what's a new and, and relevant and important information you want to convey. Right. So do you think if people were making COVID related visualizations, because they want to explore the data around their town or their country, or they want to just explore a new viz type and they've got, you know, the data, th this data is, is current and it's right there and it, it matches how they can play with different forms. Do you think that they need to, should people be saying something like an, a disclaimer at the top of the viz that says, I'm not an expert. I'm just, I'm just trying something out. Just found a spreadsheet somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I think so too. So to some degree. So for COVID, we really saw, like I saw a bunch of articles where people were just excited that they could fit like an exponential curve on something and then yeah. went wild in terms of what that meant in two weeks. Right. And, and I think it's actually dangerous to, you know, put stuff like this out there. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> so I mean, to I think some degree, it is justified. And there were quite a bunch of folks who are technically skilled but know nothing about sociology right. or uh, health or or whatever who made big claims about how this thing should be treated, right, or, yeah. or handled. And I'm I'm always for a dialogue, and and I think I'm always also for like bring the target audience on board or the ex domain experts or ideally both right and and because so often when you do that you realize how very simple things you think are totally clear you know can be very very much misread like we saw that with the flatten the curve graphic where i think everybody who's yeah. sort of trained in reading visualizations understood it's sort of an illustration of sorts of a principle Right. Um, it's not to be read exactly, but some people actually misread it and said like, well, the areas under these curves, then they should be the same or they should not be the same or flattening the curve. That's much too weak of a response. We need to, I don't know, smash it or, you know, whatever. Right. Like, they, they, so people often run wild with like associations and, and, mm -hmm. and extrapolations of what you've done. So you have to be very careful and, and yeah, what you put out there. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the other difference is between the COVID data and say unemployment numbers is that if someone misinterprets COVID data and they start going out and clustering with people, you, you kill people. Whereas yeah. if you don't totally understand that there's uncertainty around the unemployment rate estimate, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, <that's laughs> end up killing people necessarily. Right. So I feel like that's the, that, that's the, the gravity of the situation is one that warrants a different, Maybe yeah, and there's a lot of subtlety, like how do different countries report? What do they count as a COVID-related death? Um, you know, all these things are fairly complex and, and the data quality is absolutely not there to just make a simple line chart and say like, oh, it speaks for itself. You know, it, it's, it's not one of these cases. <laughs> right, sure. right. It's not one of those cases, yeah. Um, so Cora has an interesting question about um, how experts in different domains cooperate with each other. Um, well, specifically with COVID, but I think it's a, a broader question. I don't know, Cora, if you want to unmute yourself and, and join the conversation. Uh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Because I think uh, it's a broader question that you're asking. Yeah, because uh, I am just a beginner of the visualization because I am uh, very curious about how uh, professionals cooperate with each other when doing this kind of uh, uh, integrated project. I don't know yeah. if you guys have thoughts on, I mean, I know you guys have talked about this on various platforms and podcasts. I don't know if you have thoughts on these cooperating across disciplines. Do you want to start? I'm, I'm just trying to unpack the, the, the question itself. So when you say experts in different domains cooperate in a, this project, you mean, say, I don't know, uh, an economist and uh, an epidemiologist together? Uh, yeah, and the uh, visualization experts, like. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I have anything particularly intelligent or insightful to say here. <laughs> <laughs> I can take it. I mean, I, yeah, I do these types of projects. Right? So. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, yeah, so I occasionally work with scientists or with like, I always work with some sort of domain expert. Like if a client commissions me, they will be an expert in what their business is or what their organization does. And I often work with scientists as well. And let's say in the ideal case, um, the expert understands sort of the, the type of work we do as data visualization experts, what we, what we can do and also the types of inputs we need. Often, if they haven't done much work with designers or data visualization experts specifically, uh, you'll have to explain that a bit and, and lay it out first, like what types of dialogue you're looking for or at which points you like to work for yourself and at which points you want to exchange, uh, you know, and, and have feedback and so on. And ideally, you'll get like an objective at the beginning or you debate the objective, like why are we doing this project? Like what are we trying to achieve? Who are we targeting? Is this like for yourself, for your peers, for the general audience. This might totally change the type of project you even do, right? It's like who, who you're addressing. Uh, and the other thing you really wanna have is a data set and, and a data set you can work with and where the domain expert knows what's interesting about it. So you can, if you have first visuals, go back to them and say like, does this match your understanding of the data? Is there something else we should try and so on? And 
ideally your client or the expert would work with you on the strategy level and the communication goals level and the, the high level bullet points, let's say you want to hit and then leaves you alone in figuring out what's the best effective, most effective visual representation, because this can be a bit of a nonlinear process or it needs a lot of experimentation and sort of a certain immersion. And um, my feeling is it's, it's good then if, if you then come up with a couple of different options and then go back to the client or the main expert and, and debate which one works best. But it, I am personally, like some, some people even co-design that they would actually like, you know, together work on, on figuring out the perfect design. But I'm more um, fond of like separating the roles a bit and just having different hats in, in the so, project. Thank you. Yeah, one, sure. I think one, one thing that I want to add to that, that is a strategy that I personally use may be, may be of interest. I think whenever I meet with someone who is, uh, I mean, for me, it's a little different because I don't really have real clients. I, I work at universities, but we have research projects and I, I, I often meet with people who, have, um, who are in a way the target end users of, of what we develop. And um, what happens in many cases is, um, say, people come to my office, they have a problem. We start talking about the problem and they say something like, oh, I want to create a visualization that does that, does that. And so that they, they communicate their goals and intent in terms of the, the tool that they envision, right? Mm, the solution already, right? They yeah, come with the solution, solution yeah. right? And then I, I, so what I do, I stop them and say, okay, fine. Um, what questions do you have? I don't even ask about the problem because the problem can be fuzzy, right? I say, okay, so you have a data, you clearly have a data set, right? There are cases where you don't even have a data set, but let's assume you have a data set. What I ask is like, can you write down for me 20 questions that you have, right? Because, and, and they're like, the, the first reaction is always like a little bit, oh, let me think, what questions do I have? But it's such a powerful and simple tool. I think working around questions is such a good tool because later on in the project, then I can use these questions to see if we can actually answer those questions. And I always found this, this, this tool really, really powerful and very simple, of course. Yeah. Do either do you have keep a, notes on these first discussions because often you start with, with a very fresh and clear view on what the actual problem is. And <laughs> as you go into the project, things change and everything transforms and you tend to forget like the simple truths, you know, or the simple yeah. questions you want to answer. So keep yeah. track of these and midway through, go through them and see if you're exactly. still on track and answering them because yeah. it's so easy to get lost in, in all the details. Yeah. Do either of you have like um, a set set of questions or like a template? I guess maybe this is more for more. It's like, do you have a set set of questions that you ask every um, client to, to start that, that process? <laughs> I, have, I tend to use the same ones over and over again, but I'm not super strict. Like it's not really for me a right. fixed list of, sure. oh, I need to really, really know this, but let me see. I could bring it up. Let me see. So, I'm so I used, we, were, we were talking yeah. about having a checklist the other day. Moritz, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, checklists are good, but I'm not super strict about it. But yeah. Do, can you see this one? Yeah. 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 So, so this one says, why are we doing this? What are you hoping to achieve? Who are we targeting? How's the end product going to be used? How are we publishing? Like the medium can be important too, right? Is it like, right. yeah podcast or video or whatnot. What yeah. data do we have? Which other existing materials should we take into account? So it's also worth like asking, okay, do you have like maybe a PowerPoint about the whole thing? Have you written an article already? Is like, has anybody else visualized the data? You know, often like just going one step outside can, can bring in so much extra info. Mm. Which constraints do we have? Like, you know, what, what's, what is a no-go, you know, or what have you tried that definitely doesn't work? What, what will not, never be, you know, possible? Who's responsible for what? Like who writes the text? Um, you know, who, who promotes the piece in the end, uh, all this stuff. Um, and also who else is doing something similar right now? <laughs> because there's always somebody else, like <laughs> you want to understand, like what's the, what's the playground more or less, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but as I said, uh, it's more of a conversation. So I don't really try right. to take all these No, no but that, yeah, but you have these sort the of types of questions. things I'm, I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Right, cool. 
Um, so there's a bunch of questions, so I'll just put people in order here. So um, Raul, and then Simon, and then Doug. Um, so Raul, if you want to go first. Raul has been uh, pretty consistently here uh, every afternoon. So <laughs> got to hand it to those Peruvians. They're always hanging in there. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, Enrico. Hey. 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 hey there. Congrats for the you. podcast. I'm, I'm a follower, and I think it's great, a great source. Uh, for data visualization. And I want to ask uh, Enrico or Moritz, I don't know, uh, um, how can I be truthful uh, with my visualization and at the same time embrace uncertainty? Particularly in this time with COVID-19, when most of the experts will say to you, we just don't know. We just don't know yet. So we have to be truthful at the same time we have to embrace uncertainty and at the same time there is a lot of people that wants to know in, in real time, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, welcome to yeah. 2020. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You want to take this it's, one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> John, <laughs> this is too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you were hoping for softball questions. Like, what microphone do you use? <laughs> I thought that was supposed to be an easy one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't what is that, truth? I, Let's start with that. <laughs> yeah, I like the truth and beauty open. Yeah, know. what is beauty? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll do what is beauty. Um, the answer to both of those is Moritz, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, so, um, I was teaching to my student the other day and I was assigning, um, creating an assignment that was basically a data analysis done through several visualizations. And as I was halfway through it, I was like, I think what I have to teach students is attitude, right? What's the right attitude? Mm. I, I, I really believe in attitude. And I don't know how to teach to have, how to have the right attitude, but I do believe that attitude is, is crucial, right? And uh, so what kind of attitude or virtues do you want to have in, in data visualization designers or more, or data experts at large? I think you want to have people who are um, at the same time, say, curious, right? Um, humble, but also display some courage, right? You have to have the courage to, I think it's, mm. it's a nice trade-off between curiosity, humbleness, and, and courage, and, and, and staying open, right? Staying open to the fact that, look, we are, you are literally always wrong. Right, mm -hmm. literally always. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> true, yeah. So, yeah. that's the humble right. part. Yeah, yeah. You right. can it, get it right. Yeah, you yeah. can get it right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, what's your goal? Is it is your goal to go out there and say that's my that's the truth? I don't think that's your goal. On the other hand, you can just write, "Hey, look, I don't know anything." <laughs> so, <laughs> so why, well, why are you are you putting this thing out there? So that, I think that the reason why it's hard is because a trade off, and in a trade off, you can say it's either black or white. We we tend to love black or white, but life is not black or white. It's a, it's a mix of of, of contrasting attitudes, and um, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. that's. I don't know how to teach that, but yeah. That's yeah. No, but I think the humbleness is a great point because for so many years, I think we have sort of a bit sold the illusion that truth in data visualization is a technical matter in terms of if you use the right encoding for the data, if the data is right, then by definition, your chart is truthful, right? And I think by now we realize, oh, that's way too simplified. And, mm. and we realize how much preconception or expectations or existing attitudes shape on a very fundamental level how we interpret stuff. And uh, there's this great paper about the curse of knowledge, which uh, came out at Kai or Viz last year, I can't remember, yeah. but that really demonstrates that depending on what you expect to see, you see totally different things in the chart. And as a chart designer or as a data visualization designer, we have to be so humble and accept that we as the creators always see a chart in a totally different light than our audience. And you can never see it with these fresh eyes or these sort of also biased eyes that somebody else will see the chart. And so you have to observe how people react to it and, and adjust to that. And uh, mm -hmm. 
that's also something where in the past I would be much more like, yeah, that's the way I designed it. And that's the, it's a good design. <laughs> you know, and if you can't read it, well, I'm sorry. And, and by now I'm also much more humble in that respect and, and understand much better that in the end, all that counts is if people understand it and, and read it the right way, no matter what you intended or what you thought would be the right way to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was great. I think that brings up a whole bunch of other questions about process and how we've changed our approach over time. But there are other questions to get to, which are going to be even harder, Enrico. Just you oh, know, prepare yourself. Bring you uh, <laughs> now you're ready. You warmed up a little bit. All right. Yeah. Um, so, Simon, I don't know if you want to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question. I think Doug has a fairly similar question, too. So, um, Simon may have. Hello? Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, Enrico and Moritz, uh, you did an episode in 2016 with Helen Kennedy, Jeremy Boy, and Andy Kirk, and you asked, how do we ensure correct interpretation? You know, since misinterpretation is harmful, especially now, um, should we include a kind of test to measure one's visualization slash data literacy? Um, should there be a compulsory tutorial? Something else? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we, we, that's just like a driver's license for data. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you said that in the, in the episode, and uh, I kind of that was interesting because yeah, it 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 means that if people don't get certified in a way, you know, we leave them potentially taking the wrong um, message, and I think that's mm. uh, worrisome to me anyway. Um, so, you know including a test is maybe um, too far, but I just wondered if we should inform people if they're making the wrong interpretation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's so start? interesting because, yeah, we had like the, the data literacy topic was big like a few years ago. And my feeling is by now the debate has shifted a bit because if you call it literacy, you're sort of blaming the the people who don't know what the right thing is, right? It's sort of like, oh, it's a bit talking down to people who are not as skilled, actually. Right. Um, and I think by now we, uh, or a lot of people see it a bit the other way around that uh, we shouldn't like expect that anybody takes like a data visualization class just to understand what we try to convey, but we have to convey information in a way that is unmistakable and um, that doesn't require any literacy, right? And <laughs> I think it's sort of turning the, 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 the obligation to act a bit around. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's also the, the much better and fairer way to, to look at things. And I think one way to avoid misinterpretation is never to assume that a chart or data just speaks for itself. But if you have a message to convey or if you want to suggest a certain interpretation, put it in the title put it in the caption, put it in the legend, and put it in the chart. Like basically be redundant with, if there is a main message that you want to convey and, and make sure this chart cannot be turned around to say the opposite. Just put it there in a redundant way. Don't leave it open to interpretation. And on the other hand, if you don't yeah. know what the interpretation is, be clear about that as well. And maybe put a question in the title or present two conflicting data sets and say like, well, if we look at it per capita, it looks like that. If we look at it in total, it looks like that. Who's right? Who's wrong? Let's debate, right? And, but right. just be very clear about what, how you as, a, as an author um, relate to, to the information just be much more explicit. I think that's um, so simple. Like people often ask about, right. oh, accessibility or how can I make this, you know, easy to read for everybody. The simplest answer is always, well, come up with a really good title <laughs> or like <laughs> write one sentence, you know, that summarizes what's going on, you know? And, and so a lot is really related to text. In the end. So yeah. Moritz, you, um, do you, when you, you create a lot of like bespoke sort of things, like the one that pops in my head is, I mean, there's the, the food one you did with Google, but also the bees one you did for, I think, Scientific American. Sure. So do yeah. you think of doing the, the titles and the text, the annotation differently if you did the bees one as like a bar chart or a line chart? Would you approach them differently mm -hmm. or would it still be basically the same, except that you'd have to explain how to read the charts a little bit differently, right? Yeah. So these days I do either more internal tools for companies and mm -hmm. there we get away with a lot of 
fairly obscure stuff because people are like they use it like for a long time and they they can't we can sort of work on the assumption that experts use it that sort of find their way around um and so we don't have to be super explicit if you do something for a magazine or like yeah twitter you know you want to be mega explicit of course like what everything means and, and what you want to look at um so it again it really depends also on your audiences or on your media how how much you have to spell things out or how much you can be obscure and a bit like uh, uh, artsy or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, right now I don't do much of these classical, he, I'll explain to you something with the means of data type projects. Um, yeah, right. Uh, but if I do those by now, I really, really, really care about the texts a lot. <laughs> and so yeah. I, I, I really think about like how, what's a good wording for all this? What's a good tone? what's a good metaphor you know you could sort yeah. of play with in the visual and in the text like it's more general communication suddenly than than is it a bubble chart or a line chart yeah. mm -hmm. so i'm i'm uh i'm curious um because i i follow the same i have the same approach but i'm curious is that is the root of why you take a more active um thoughtful approach with titles and text is that because is that just through experience or does it have to do with Michelle Borkin's paper, which is like really kind of like getting, you know, letting a Rico in here a little bit with some academic stuff. So, but is it mostly for you experience? I mean, that, that paper for me was, was pretty eye opening when you look at some of the images that they have that people in that study were like, you know, they're look, they're reading text. Mm. Do you want to summarize the paper real quick? So people know. Maybe Enrico should if he it. knows it. I, I can do it, but you know, I'm just I'm just a humble oh. moderator here. So <laughs> the one about memorability? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh one of Michelle Borkin's uh famous papers. Yeah. Um she's a she's a professor at North I always forget Northwestern, Northeastern. She's Northeastern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um yeah, and that's about what people remember from from charts that they that they are shown. So they run a number of experiments where they show a lot of different charts and then they ask, what do you remember, basically? Uh, not really what do you remember, how much they remember, they check how much they remember each chart and then they figure out which elements of a chart may be responsible for the reason that they are more memorable than others. And uh, it's a super interesting piece of work. And they also have some eye tracking, eye tracking um, type of, um, methodology there so they they can know how much the reader how much time the reader has spent in each area of the chart so it's it's really cool yeah and basically there are, there are a number of uh, findings there and one of the main findings is that titles are really really important and uh, there was this running joke that you have to have a figure of a dinosaur in your in your image because in the presentation there was a <laughs> having, having images is seems to be important and and she used a dinosaur so everybody said that it's important to have a dinosaur picture <laughs> but yes so titles are super important as well as as Moritz said I think what is that's another of those things that I personally been changing over time right. I, being somewhat, um, um, I think that the way I learned data visualization is of course through um, academic sources and we almost never talk about the, the annotation layer, right? Still today, if you open most data visualization books and look at academic courses, the annotation layer is not, is not discussed in any depth and it's crucial. I mean, without, Without text and legends and all the rest, all the contextual minor elements, they're actually fundamental. Without them, mm. you can interpret the, the chart. <laughs> so, so, so that leads to an interesting question. Back, back to Cora's early question about um, about groups working together, which, which, you know, Moritz, you took a perspective on as the as the freelancer being hired to do a to make a tool or a viz. How do you work with the domain experts? But Enrico, you just sort of mentioned this difference between the practitioner crowd and the academic crowd. And I know you've talked about this before, so I don't know if there's, uh, there's not a real question other than to say, I don't know if you have anything else you want to say about it. Just because it is- the two what, crowds? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. could have gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to give you a softball so you don't feel like it's too I, I, difficult. 
Are you trying to, to get me fired or? or I'm, try <laughs> I'm trying to get you fired up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, that's been one of my pet peeves forever. That's one of the reasons why um, I, I, I did some blogging, why I, 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 partly why I do data stories and all the rest. Um, I do think that these two set of people need to talk a lot more and it's been improving a lot actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, academics do academics and practitioners do practitioners. They do what uh -huh. they have to do. Okay. And that, that's say, fine. And now they, they talk too much to each other. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I could, I don't know if you have specific questions. I could literally talk for hours about. Well, okay. So I'll give you, I'll give you a specific question. Then, then you can talk yeah. for hours and the rest of us yeah. just listen. So how much of this, um, let's say divide between the academic crowd and the practitioner crowd is due to the tenure model in, in the academic community. So that I've talked to a lot of, a lot of researchers who say, I don't, I'm not going to write blogs. I'm not going to be active on Twitter. I'm not going to do media interviews because um, it's going to be looked down upon from my department. It doesn't help me with tenure. It doesn't help with any of that stuff. And in fact, if I spend two hours on a blog post, I've had people say this to me. If I spend two hours on a blog post, my department chair will ask why I'm not working on the next journal article. So mm -hmm. like how much of, how much of this, this lack of communication is due to the, to the existing tenure model? where it doesn't reward people for doing blogs and podcasts and that. Partly, but I don't think that's, that's the main reason, honestly. I mm -hmm. think it's more like, um, I'm going to, I'm going to say bad things. <laughs> I'm thinking of something bad. Yes. <laughs> honestly. Whiskey and nickel, little whiskey. Come on. Hold on. Yeah, this tea is done. We'll get some whiskey. We'll keep going. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to say bad things about anyone because even there, there are a, a zillion different ways you can be an academic, right? Mm -hmm. I just think that some people are, are more prone to do the um, kind of like I'm doing my thing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I believe in it and I don't want to be distracted by anything else. And that's what matters. And I have a lot of respect for these people because some of these people are going to uh, do revolutionary work and they just mm -hmm. don't care about, mm -hmm. um, about communicating their stuff or it, it, and it typically takes a long time. So there are these type of scientists. Right. And I think we do need these type these of scientists. There's also these types of practitioners, by the way, who just do exactly. their work. Right. And you know, yeah. they don't do podcasts and whatnot. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. that's right. So, exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, a good example is Stephen Few, right? <laughs> Stephen mm -hmm. is a person who undoubtedly had a huge impact on data visualization, whether, right? And um, he, doesn't do, he doesn't do interviews, he doesn't do, anything. He's not mm. on Twitter. He, he doesn't care, right? I, I talked to him. He just couldn't care. And he also thinks that he's detrimental he's to his work. He's been in quarantine, <laughs> quarantine for, for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. right? uh, yeah. That said, every time he publishes a book, I read it and I'm like, wow, I learned a lot. Right. right? Um, on the other hand, uh, me, I could never do that. I, I need to talk to people because I feel like if I don't talk to people, I don't know what is, I need to constantly check that what I'm thinking is somewhat useful to someone and I, I need to parse it through feedback, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think in the end, now that I think about it, it's a matter of style and personal, personal style. So tenure does 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 play a role, but I don't think it's all about tenure. It's all about yeah. the kind of personality that people have. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of the systems are different, and there are the I think are very different. like real obstacles that are in the way of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And and the the perspective John you presented is very valid. I think that uh, like somebody who wants to do a science career is like well. Pff, all this work I put into the blog podcast and the blog, they might, it might be minus points on my, you know, my, on my yeah. career actually. Yeah. And my, or the, the practitioner's perspective might be, well, they want me to participate in this academic book. I get nothing paid. The book will yeah. be a hundred euros. I get no <laughs> yeah. honorarium for it. <laughs> right. Nobody can read it. Like, 
I think I'll write yeah. a blog post, right? And so, yeah. Yeah. and these are very like simple and very, I think very reasonable considerations if you think about your own, like what you do, right? And so yeah. there could be better ways, I think, to meet in the middle at, see, at least some of the time. And yeah. I think there's great stuff coming also from academia, like, um, um, how's the medium publication called? Sorry, I'm blanking. On Multiple views. Multiple, Multiple views. views. Very nice. I've been yeah. linking that so often. I read every article. It's a summary always of, of really relevant research papers. That's really, really good and, and all this stuff. So it can be done. And I think Enrico, yeah. the podcast has not been detrimental to your career or maybe even helpful. Is, would that be that's right? what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Again, I, that's what I'm saying, right? So yeah. um, it's not evident to me that it's necessarily a zero sum game between what you need to do for tenure and uh, yeah. what you would rather do. I think the two things can work, work synergistically. There are lots of things that I've done before being tenured that may have seemed uh, completely irrelevant and I think they are not, not at all. So, so I wonder if it's a little bit of, because I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I work with lots of people who do great work, but they are just not comfortable talking to reporters. They're just, it's just not, you can give them as much training as you want, but they're not going to do it because it's, it's not their personality and there's nothing wrong with that. And they don't get penalized right, yeah. for it. They're just not comfortable and that's fine. So that's I fine. wonder whether part of the solution, I don't, know, I don't know if solution is the right word, but part of the issue with this is trying to, get across to people that they don't have to do everything that they don't have to have a podcast and a blog and a Twitter sure. feed that right <laughs> that that you can that you can partner with other people and let them do some of this stuff like it, it, you don't have to try to do everything all the time I think my my advice to that's what I what I tell my students uh, do good work yeah. I think the, the, the most important yeah. thing no and team up I work. think that's it's both true yeah, yeah. do sure. good work for your yeah. set a standard for yourself and whatever standard it is, people have different standards and do what you define as good work. That's what really matters. No, I think that's right. I think I, I tell <laughs> I tell people the same thing, except that I add do good work and be kind. And if you are <laughs> if you're kind to people and you do good work, it'll all like personally, my story, when I left graduate school, I took a job in a nonprofit in New York City. And one of my professors said, don't take it. You'll never, cause I wanted to work in federal government. He said, you will never be able to get back to federal government cause you'll be locked in this, in this thing. Mm -hmm. And for a variety of reasons, I took the job in New York at this nonprofit and I hate the, the job was not, it was not a good fit and I hated it. But I just, I just kept writing papers and publishing papers and ended up, you know, just getting a job at, in, in the federal government which is where I wanted to be. And yeah, it's just, you just work hard and things, Good things work out and you just when you're nice to people like that's also how things work out <laughs> um, say a bad word? yeah yeah i think you, some people make a career being assholes as well so yeah. <laughs> i could name i could that, name, name, <laughs> name i could name one in particular that i'm thinking of <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I have, um, uh, we have a, at Urban has a mentor program. So the more, you know, generally it's the senior people try to mentor some of the junior people. And there's a variety of, of areas that you try to mentor people. Is it on leadership? Is it on visibility? Is it on research? Whatever it is. And um, I'm currently working with someone who wants to increase their visibility, but they don't like Twitter. So like Twitter's a cesspool. Um, which it can be, and I know Enrico, I think you kind of view it as a little bit of a cesspool. I, I try to keep my network like it's just, I, these are the, I'm not talking, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not, talk, you know, it's going to be about data viz and then it can be okay. You just like staying in my lane a little bit. <laughs> um, so I think I, I missed a question. Let me go back a little bit. We, we moved past this, but, um, Doug had another question. He doesn't have a microphone, so he just asked me to read this. I think this is mostly for you, Enrico. Um, building on Simon's earlier question, are there studies on the types of misinterpretations associated with different types of graphics? And how do you discover the different types of misinterpretation? A really good question. Yeah, that's a great, I love this question because it's yeah. partly some of the work that I do. No, there you go. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, there are, there, are, there, are, there are studies that try to figure out how misinterpretation works. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing in my lab is been try, trying to test the classic misinterpretation, uh, the classic graphics that we know are going to mislead people, say truncation and uh, using area. Uh, what is that? If you scale um, a circle with a radius or with the area or, or stuff like that, and uh, turns out, surprise, yes, they, they lead to a lot of misinterpretations. And um, yeah, it, it, it's been more and more active. There are, there are lots of, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting research in the last few years on misinterpretation. Another really, really nice one is on uh, how easy it is to mislead someone by changing the title of a graph without changing the graph. And it turns out it's very easy. It's dramatic. <laughs> you you keep exactly the same graph and you change the title and the interpretation is completely different, which is a little depressing as well. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna paste the, the 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 paper about the papers that I mentioned later on in the in the chat if you want to. And um, Another person, a person who has been working a lot in this area and is still working a lot in this area is Michael Correll. He's a researcher at uh, Tableau Research. And if you're interested in this type of research, I suggest you to, to follow the type of work that he does. Um, he's been, uh, there is a very, very recent paper that I think it's called Visualization Mirages or something like that, Information Visualization Mirage. And, um, and it's all about uh, things that we, we think we, can, we detect in, uh, in a visualization and they're actually not there, right? So this partially answers your question about how do we know uh, what are the type of um, misinterpretations that can happen. There are, there are a lot. And I think this, this research is growing and there, there's gonna be even more. So it's, it's really, really interesting. I hope I answer your question. Um, I wish I could show you more more examples. Mm -hmm. I think Moritz wants to show something. Yeah, that's the other one from Cindy. This one's great yeah. too. Yeah, the, the, the curse yeah. of knowledge or curse of expertise. And this one makes a really nice case that depending on with which mindset you enter a visualization, your, your reading might be totally different. Here's an example of, uh, if you think like the development of violent crimes over the years and you relate to gun laws or gun restriction laws, you could either focus on this downward slope here on the left-hand side or you could compare beginning and end and come to the conclusion there's a rise and what interpretation people take depends a lot on the framing and also their, their prior beliefs um, is basically the, what they show in this paper quite well. On the mentioned um, multiple views publication. So just wanted to yeah. plug that one. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions in here, but so so maybe before we uh, before we close up, um, Morris, you were showing you were showing me something earlier before we started. You want to maybe share stuff that you're you know anything that you're working on right now, and then Enrico, if you want to do the same, you know we only got about ten minutes. If you want to sure, I mean for everybody who sort of held out that long, you can also see. <laughs> so, so one thing we haven't published yet, really properly but which was last year quite a big project for me uh, is like maybe the biggest thank you diagram that has ever been made so <laughs> uh, a friend of mine made that at a beach uh, on bali and it represents the fate of all plastic ever produced so we made this huge uh, thank you diagram out of individual pieces of plastic i was just directing remotely from here from germany but sky moray and lena klaus here in the picture and many, many volunteers create this diagram and it shows like what happens to all the plastic we have ever produced it was for a competition from National oh. Geographic and we're still debating like how to publish it. So that's why it's not properly out yet, but uh, we hope we'll get a good spot for it. So do they have Magazine, to like wash where, watch where the, 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 it looks like it's like right along where the waves show up. That's so crazy because this shot is not photoshopped or anything. It was actually the moment when the water came in and the, the, the sculpture basically was sort of destroyed that this shot was taken. That's the so, sort of our hero shot because it so yeah. nicely shows this. The, the, power, the raw power of the ocean versus the art. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, it's like a perfect, it. uh, perfect <laughs> shot actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, we had drones. It's like just this uh, hero shot, basically. So we had drones, obviously, or a drone right. for for taking all these like uh, very high um, film shots. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, that's great. Beautiful. That's another strategy to be memorable. Just go big. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that works too. Uh, yeah, but it's much that. more work. It's much more work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's fun. So we're still yeah, documenting and, and figuring out where to place it. Uh, this is the one I showed you before. This is, this is like a private project of mine. So I have, I'm keeping bees and this is like a bee right. dashboard. So I have this there's this sensor toolkit I'm using. Uh, it's from Open Beehives, uh, or open source beehives called Buzzbox. It's a little like microcontroller with a humidity sensor and temperature and so on. And so I make these uh, dashboards for my bees, <laughs> basically, so I can track how they're doing in terms of humidity and temperature and pressure. Um, I even do sound recordings. So this little thing has a microphone as well. So there's sound recordings and. Oh yeah, I, oh, sorry, I shut down the server, but there's little like spectrograms of the different frequencies and so I'm, cool. I'm nerding out even on, on B data. <laughs> on Bs, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's cool. This is a year, we're looking at a year here? Yeah, this it's even day. longer. So this is like July to, uh, and oh, so I see. here's the first winter and then there's the second one. So there's two breaks here in the timeline. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's like yeah, one yeah. and a half years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that's I just neat. plugged it in again. So there's just this one data point. So I'll have to collect right. more data for this year. Yeah. <laughs> huh. yeah, but it's uh, sort of the type of work I like to do is like crafting interfaces really to a specific purpose and, and trying to come up with like nifty little solutions for uh, what could be just a simple line chart. But I, I enjoy it more if it looks like this. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you don't need to explain it to yourself because you understand it. <laughs> Yeah, it's an expert yeah. interface for just yeah. for me, like audience for you, of one, yeah. basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, Enrico, is there anything you want to show that you're working on? Um, Talk about? I think continuing on the thing that I was talking about, we just have a new paper out with Michael that is called Truncating the Y Axis Threat or Menace. <laughs> Curse or blessing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think so. We have a study there. Um, let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, I just found it on his yeah. Oh, on OSF. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, quick answer: Is it evil yeah. or not? Yeah. No, that, that's more. That's more about comparing, um, say, axis truncation across different different charts, right? Ah, and how uh, do you do the, it? Ah. the common the common idea is that line charts are okay, whereas uh, hmm. bar charts are not. But it turns out that is not it's not the case. It's, oh damn! It's, 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 damn it. I've been arguing that for years. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are ruining everything. There must be a flaw in that study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so next, yeah. you're going to tell us pie the charts. Pure and simple pie. truth is rarely pure and never simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I told you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, it, uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's what we had. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say? <laughs> well, I'll say the one. Uh, this is the one thing that I'm going to take out of today. I think it's now come up a couple of times. I think this is this is the this is the Venn diagram Aww. I'm going to take out of today. Aww. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I'll get it to two right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, great. Well, this was fun. This is great. Uh, there was another question in the chat. There was a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want, yeah. If you VR want to talk about, yeah. yeah. Um, VR and AR, they are boon or a hindrance. Super interesting. I mean, the, the big hype is over, I think. And by now you'd think, oh, there should be solid applications of VR, AR for database, but I haven't seen super many. Yeah, Enrico, how about you? Same. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know why. I am personally, I'm super excited like about AR. Let's say you have a big table and you do like a relief map with like little yeah. animations. And, you know, I'd be super excited about that. And I was like, wow, man, so many people are going to build this stuff, but it doesn't quite happen. Maybe there's a big technological gap or the stuff there's exists, but we don't see it. Or well, there's probably a big upfront cost to get it. 
going, because, right? yeah. I mean, I know the this... use case. I think there's no clear, yeah. like if you want to have a new technology or new software or whatever, it always has to be much, much better than your existing solutions. And maybe it's not clear what the, you know, X fold increase like in the experience is or X fold in increase in decision making or something just because it's VR. Um, I'm not sure, but it's, I mean, it can be super exciting if it's done well. Yeah. Um, in the in the States, the Weather Channel was using a little bit of it during one of the previous hurricanes where the, the meteorologist was standing talking about it and she had like the water filling up behind oh, That was so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was so, really, really good. Yeah. 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 Makes it much more tangible, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. When you see like, I oh, that's what they're talking about with that much yeah, water. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, Simon followed up in a question about data physicalization, if that's a word. Um, people being able to connect with data that they can hold, touch, and manipulate. I mean, I feel yeah. like that's like that's why I like going to museums. Yeah, yeah, there's Museum. huge potential there. I think right. because also there's this social aspect. If you have something yeah. you can point to together, somebody has it in your hand, somebody else can comment on it. I think that's the biggest part of data physicalization is that you, you can enjoy it together. And so much of our screen-based stuff is so limited. It's just us thinking about something, you know, alone. <laughs> it's just just a sad <laughs> life, you know? And, <laughs> and I think the, the physical aspect is, is in many ways, the, the biggest part is the social dimension. In, in yeah. Opinion. Yeah. I think that's, that, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we're at three o'clock Eastern time. Thanks guys for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Um, Thank as you. always. Thanks for inviting um, us. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, for all your questions. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Next time we'll bring a philosophy degree. Uh, <laughs> or like the main expert, an actual one. Uh, <laughs> to answer um, all these very fundamental <laughs> questions. <laughs> I did get one question on the shirt for today. So the shirt for today is, is the snow, the John snow map. So, um, I'm trying to figure out how to make more. I'm out of shirts. I, you know, yeah. I'm not that big of a wardrobe. So, but you're not an um, epidemiologist, so I'm not sure if you should wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just a quick plug for next week. So, uh, Monday is kind of on the fence. I might need to take a day off from this, but um, Tuesday, Dan Rome will be chatting with us, which will be a lot of fun. Wednesday is the one that I'm really excited about. I'm going to try teaching kids about data visualization. So if you have kids and you want them to tune in, Ooh, all they need is a piece of paper and some colored pencils. We're going to do, we're going to make some stuff. Um, when and is then that, John? I want, I want my kids when, to participate. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Uh, okay. Can you do it in German? <laughs> <laughs> I could, I could, I could, but, I, I could, but the only word I'd be able to say is Schwabish. So that would be it. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> yeah, it's a good start. <laughs> um, so Dan Rome on Tuesday, yeah. me on Wednesday, uh, Nadi Bremer will be here on Thursday. She just released a new project. Um, awesome. That looks great. And then on awesome. Friday, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein will talk about their yeah. book. Uh, data Quite plan. the lineup. Very yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. Next week's going to be great. Um, and more people come in the week after. And then um, one of my co my colleagues today said, this could go on forever. Are you really planning to do one of these every day forever? And I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> you could broadcast 24 seven, John. <laughs> John's life. <laughs> <laughs> just put the kids over there, just put yeah, a bowl yeah. of food out for them. And they'll be fine, they'll be fine. <laughs> um, all right, guys, thanks a lot. I appreciate you, uh, you taking the time. This was a lot of fun. And uh, thanks everybody for, um, for chatting with us and asking great questions. This was, this was great. Um, yeah. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And um, yeah, check in with you. Great stuff. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.